Hi, I'm Susie Larson. Thank you for listening to Susie Larson Live. Faith Radio podcasts are only possible because of your support. So thanks for giving and thanks for sharing with a friend. It's only just a matter of. Welcome to Suzy Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His amazing and beautiful presence in your life. Well, believe it or not, the Advent season starts in a little over two weeks. Don't turn off yet. Just stay with me. We're going to slow the pace today. We're going to take a few deep breaths, and we're going to consider what God might want to say to us as we approach this season. I'm I'm so big on this season that we often say that God cares so much about our beginnings and our endings, and that the way that we go into these next weeks takes intention. If you want them to be meaningful, if you want Jesus to be at the center, you actually got to think about that and, and make that a priority. Well, Caroline Cobb joins me today to talk about her new book, Advent for Exiles. 25 Devotions to Awaken Gospel Hope in Every Longing Heart. And as a writer myself, I got to just say, I appreciate it when I read someone who can write. And this woman, wow, she writes in this lyrical way, which is not a surprise because she's a singer-songwriter. This is her first book, brilliant, and it's beautiful. And if you just want a fresh look and a, a really a deeper life look at the Advent story. We've got four copies to give away. Again, the title is Advent for Exiles, 25 Devotions to Awaken Gospel Hope and Every Longing Heart. You can text the word book to 877-933-2484. Quick announcement before we hear from Caroline. Maybe you've heard this already, but just in case you haven't, I recorded 15 short audio clips. They're about two to three minutes long. It's for the person walking through the battle. And how do you hold on to your identity when you feel like you're under fire? How do you remember who God is? How do you get wise to the enemy's schemes and keep your footing when it seems the storms are raging all around you? I wrote the, or I, I should say I recorded those based on a book I wrote, Strong in Battle, and uh, you, they're free. You can just text the word strong, and they'll be texted to you probably two a week for the next several weeks. They're free. They're just two to three minutes. It's like me sending you an audio text. That's kind of what it's like. So if you want them, text the word strong to 877-933. 2484. Now let me tell you about my guest. We'll get her on the show. Before her 30th birthday, Caroline Cobb set a goal to write a song for every book of the Bible in one year. Wow. That year set a new calling into motion to tell God's story through music and other creative work, helping you rehearse it and respond to it as you go about your everyday life. Caroline's been featured by Christianity Today, the Gospel Coalition, the Rabbit Room, Risen Motherhood, and many more, with a home and a hunger named among the best albums of the decade by the Gospel Coalition. She and her husband, Nick, live in Dallas, Texas, with their three children, Ellie, Harrison, and Libby. Caroline, so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for having me, Susie. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to this conversation. And and Caroline, the question I ask every day at the open of the show is really an important one. It's not a throwaway question and it's not a filler. It really is because we love to hear from God. We know that he speaks to us through his word and through impressions, through the power of the spirit. And I'm just wondering, as you've been walking with God just lately these days, what's he been impressing upon your heart? Yeah, I I would love to read from Isaiah. Um, It's one of my favorite Old Testament books. Um, Isaiah 51, 3 says, For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her Mm -hmm. wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. And then in Isaiah 25, 2, it says, He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. And I don't know about you, Susie, but I feel like lately life has felt a little bit heavy. Um, Our own family is is doing okay. Things are going well. But just in the community right around me, um, there's a lot of heaviness, some diagnoses, some marriages that are struggling. Uh, Just the other night, I actually read these verses at a little candlelight vigil uh, for a little girl that passed away at my kid's school and Mm. sang some songs. And 
I just, I feel like even when we turn on the news, there's just so much uh, hard. There's so many heavy things. And even in the church, um, you know, leaders failing, things like that. So I don't want to be a Debbie Downer here, but I think that in these hard things, we acknowledge uh, that we need God. These are thorny wilderness places. And then God reminds us that he can make even these barren wilderness places like the Garden of Eden. And I love that image that he delights to make a garden grow, even in the driest, darkest places. And one day, our strong hope is that the curse of sin and death that we see all around us will be swallowed up forever. And he's going to wipe away tears from all faces. And Mm -hmm. we are going to praise him on that day. And so I think for me, just reminding myself that, yes, things are thorny and heavy, but we have such a strong hope. And our news, the good news that we have in Jesus is even better because these hard things are happening. And so to say one day death will be gone, there will be no more funerals, you know, in the midst of these hard things happening around me um, is proclaiming Jesus's good news. And I love this image and I, I think it's true. And I'm so thankful that God makes gardens grow in our broken places. Boy, does he ever. That's just beautiful. Well, Caroline, I would love a little backstory on your faith journey. How did you come to Christ and when did he become your everything? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, when I was a junior in high school, I had, you know, prayed and, and talked to God a little bit, but it was then that I really began to spend time in God's word every day and pray every day. And so I would say that, um, it went from something that I thought I was supposed to do to something that I was actually acting out. And when that happened, he really started to change me. And um, I felt in a way that I, you know, to the point where I couldn't even go back, you know, and um, Mm. in college, I had a season of doubt and was struggling with kind of the problem of evil and how could God be good? And yet these hard things happen. Um, I went to a big public university and I was in this philosophy class And even in that season, just realizing that uh, he is the creator and I'm the creation. And again and again, I feel like he's shown me how good the gospel is, Um, even as a Christian, just realizing, oh, goodness, this good news that I believed when I was a junior in high school is actually better than I even thought. You know, the further Mm. we go in our Christian life, the more and more um, I see how good this good news is. Uh, That's at least been true for me. So it began my junior year of high school, but I think that he continues to deepen my faith and make me realize that decision that I made when I was a junior in high school actually had profound implications and the good news is just getting better. Yeah, I agree with you so much. Salvation is so much more than we we ever first imagined. You know, it's not a check the box, get out of hell free, you know, give right. a, a kind of a nod to God. It's like a total transformational shift of who we are, the trajectory of our lives, and what Jesus won for us, what he offers to us daily, it mm-hmm. blows me away. Like the more I get to know him, the more I am in awe that he would love us and lead us and give us new mercies. Um, I don't know. I'm in perpetual awe the more I get mm-hmm, to know him. Too. And don't you feel like the more you get to know him, the more you get to know yourself? I mean, I I did, I did, knew I needed saving. I didn't know how deep my sin and selfishness and self-preservation went until I became less so. And I know that's going to be continually unveiled until I get to see him and I'm finally like him. But the more that I grow, the more I realize I didn't even know how much saving I need and how much selfishness was baked in me. But he did, and he went to the cross yeah. anyway. Right. And I love the idea of, for me, just as a kind of a storyteller by nature, songwriter, just think very imaginatively. I love the idea that he plucked us out of one story and put us into another. Yes, And so just good. like you said, it totally transforms how you see the world, what your purpose is and your goals and your hopes, uh, how you experience suffering, all of these things. And I'm just so thankful that I'm living in God's story, you know, by his grace. Mm-hmm. Oh, so good. So how and when did Advent season first come alive to you? That's a great question too. I, you know, I grew up more of in a, in a low church situation, Bible churches, and Advent wasn't really something that we practiced a lot in the churches that I grew up in. 
in terms of like making it a separate season. I think sometimes people think that Christmas and Advent are kind of squished together as one long season. You know, Advent is like a rehearsal for Christmas, you know? And I think that I've realized in these last few years that in the church calendar, we have these seasons that go one before the other because one is setting us up for the other. So they're distinct, but they're also complementary. So we have like Lent, which prepares us to rejoice all the more in Easter. If we're willing to confess our sin, then the truth of the resurrection is just glorious when Easter comes around and we can celebrate all the more. And it's the same with Advent. So I think it's it's hard to explain or to note exactly when it came alive to me, but I think I, I noticed that I needed Advent to help me rejoice better in the gospel of Christmas. If we're willing to kind of sit in that ache of Advent and the longing of Advent, then Christmas really comes alive for us. So it's something Mm. that's become really important to me. Amen. So talk about the title and why Advent for Exiles. Yeah, the the idea. um, So a few years ago, I put out an album called A Sea to Sunrise, and it was a lot from the book of Isaiah. We had been studying that at church. And Isaiah, you know, is this book that's written for the people in exile. They're about to go to exile. And then some people believe they could have read it while they were in exile. And it's this warning of, you know, you need to uh, follow the Lord and turn from your sin or else you will be sent into exile. But it's also a lot of comfort to say that there is going to be a Messiah that's going to come and make his home with you even in your exile. And so I started writing all these songs and then uh, the the devotional came out of those songs as I did a deeper dive into the scripture, into the book of Isaiah, into that theme in, in all of the Bible. And the theme of exile is something that when you look at it, it really runs from Genesis all the way to Revelation, from when Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden and they're separated from the presence of God through the Old Testament exile, and then when Jesus comes and makes his home with us, um, and then the Holy Spirit makes his home with us, and then finally in Revelation, when he will make his home with us forever. And so this is something that is uh, really a theme that runs throughout the whole of Scripture, and right now our identity is exiles. The New Testament says that we are sojourners and exiles and citizens of another kingdom. And so I thought that Advent and exile and these themes in scripture really went well together because exiles are longing for home. You know, we are longing, we're pilgrims on the way home. And that really is our identity as Christians all year long. But Advent gives us a special time to set aside and remember that so that the, again, the gospel of Christmas, that Jesus is coming to make his home with us forever. He already did, and he's coming back. That becomes all the sweeter if we let ourselves sit in the kind of the ache of Advent, but also the ache of our exile, the reality that uh, he has come to make his home with us, but we're not quite fully home yet. One day we Mm. will be. So good. So friends, you may feel like too early to ask you about this, but truly it's just a couple of weeks away. So is there anything special? I'm asking our listeners now to text in anything special you do to welcome Advent. I mean, what do you do, if anything, to make Advent a time of remembrance, a time of expectancy? I would love some fresh ideas. Why don't you text me, 877-933-2484. Talking to Caroline Cobb. She's a singer, songwriter, and now an author. Just released a brand new, beautiful book, Advent for Exiles, 25 Devotions to Awaken Gospel Hope in Every Longing Heart. If you want to end the drawing in a separate text, just text the word book, and it should kick back a link to you, 877-933-2484. We will be back in just a moment. You know what? Christmas is my favorite time of the year. Why? Because people openly talk about Jesus, celebrate Jesus, and are open to conversations about Jesus. Advent means to prepare for an arrival, to make space for new beginnings. And we as Christians, we prepare him room. We make space to celebrate Jesus, not only because he came, but because he's coming again. Our good friend, Max Lucado, wrote an amazing Advent devotional titled In the Manger. He wants to remind you that you're never truly alone because God sent Jesus to be with you. Emmanuel, God with us. Enter to win your copy of Max Lucado's In the Manger today 
at MyFaithRadio.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, talking to singer, songwriter, and now author Caroline Cobb. She's got a brand new, beautiful book out, Advent for Exiles, 25 Devotions to Awaken Gospel Hope in Every Longing Heart. And if you appreciate kind of beautiful, lyrical writing, good writing with deep content, this book has it for sure. we got a handful of copies to give away. You can text the word book to 877-933-2484. And I asked you also, if you've got just creative ways that you welcome Advent, um, I would love to hear from you. Uh, maybe you light a candle. Maybe you light a candle every day. Uh, Natasha says, I like to read the Old Testament prophecies to feel what it must have felt like to anticipate the first arrival of the Messiah. And as I wait for the second arrival, so great. Oh, Sherry's so sweet. She said she reads my um, <laughs> my my Advent Devo. That's awesome. And uh our producer says she reads at Ann Voskamp's Jesse's Tree as they celebrate St. Nicholas Day by doing something anonymous for someone else um, and uh, does a Lego Advent wreath and also reads my Devo sometimes. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. And so you talk about, and there's a first section in your book about the first exile, and you give this description of Eden that I have to read because I'd already planned to read it. My producer, Angela, said, did you read how she described Eden? (laughs) I'm like, okay, that's a confirmation. So friends, listen to this. This is good writing right here. Can you imagine Eden? The garden is just bursting with beauty and light, the creativity and abundant goodness of God on full display. Picture creatures as wildly diverse as the platypus and porcupine, the baboon and butterfly. Catch the scent of a thousand flowers springing up like miracles from the soil. Watch as the vibrant sunset paints the sky orange and pink. Can you imagine reaching up to take hold of fruit weighing heavy in the trees? Taking a bite, feeling its juice dribble down your chin? Can you hear the babble and splash and roar of a great river branching into four more? Oh my goodness, the wonder of it. God himself has made his home there, walking among the trees. Eden shimmers with his sacred presence. First of all, that's amazing. And second of all, talk (laughs) about the first exile. You touched on it a little bit, but say more about it. Yeah, I think um, I wanted to really put us there. I mean... I think sometimes we read those first few chapters of Genesis and we don't really use our imagination to engage in it. And so it becomes rote or, oh, we've read this before. We know what happens. But I think if we really imagine how good it was that we were at home with God and God was at home with us, then we can recognize what a tragedy it was that just like this unnatural wrenching, I think is how I write about it in the second day and the reflection on the second day when they were cast out of Eden and out of God's presence, because they were designed for God's presence. We were designed for God's presence. And then when we recognize that, how good is the good news that Jesus came to be God's presence among us again? He came out to us in our exile. And so I think the important thing there is to note that we are all sort of soaked with this sense of exile as J as Tolkien, the writer of Lord of the Rings, talks about, we we were all meant to be at home with God, uh, but we are not in the fullest sense yet, and and yet Jesus has been sent to make his home with us. Mm, so good. This dear listener says, as a grandmother of young boys, 9 and 12, do you have any special advice for me or suggestions for explaining Advent to them and making it come alive? Mm. Is that, is that is that a question for me? Yes, it is. Love, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I think for, you know, a lot of us, it's such a time of just people really stuff in as much celebration as possible. And it mm-hmm. almost feels exhausting. By the time you get to Christmas, you're just so finished. You know, you just want to be done. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that I have tried to subtract in our own family in order to make Christmas more beautiful. So Mm -hmm. Instead of adding new things, deciding what are the main things that I can do that would stir my kids, my family's excitement for Jesus. And then what are some things that maybe the culture has told me I should be doing, or maybe my mom guilt has just told me I should be doing, but is actually not that important to my family or to me. And it's definitely not helping us get excited about Jesus. And so subtract, 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 so that the main thing uh, can be the main thing so that we can long for Jesus and and put things in that will help us 
be expectant of him. So that. for some people that, yeah, that, ex, that subtraction will be different for different people. Um, but anyway, I think that's been so important for our family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think to plan to not to have plans ahead of time, like now is when I like to go ahead on my calendar and block off times where I just have plans not to have plans and we'll put a fire on, you know, we'll put on some instrumental music, we'll read a book, we'll sit and just give thanks. And, uh, we just ponder the goodness of God and, uh, be still and know that I am God, things like that. I just think it's such a powerful thing to be mindful. And uh, as you said, if we're not careful, we race through it until we feel lethargic, overspent, overfed, and toxic. And we stumble into the new year that way. And it's just no way to exit or enter a year. So to be mindful and even do some subtracting is a beautiful Beautiful idea. You wrote about, in this first section, about the first exile, about the pinnacle of God's handiwork, and which was making us in his image. We are his handiwork, his artwork. And yet you say, we're not meant to bear God's image alone. Even Paul, when he talked about the church, wrote about how together we're built into God's house. And you further write, God means for his people to be a garden temple, a dwelling place for his sacred presence, expanding ever outward like Eden— until the whole earth is filled to bursting with his glory. So much about that is so beautiful. But talk about first, you know, that we are his artwork, his creativity, his masterpiece, and yet we're not meant to be his image, to bear his image alone, that we are joined together for the greater glory and the greater story. Yeah, um, I love the idea that we are not alone. Um, and each of us, you know, it talks about the body of Christ. It talks about the family of God. We're each playing different roles and have, you know, the toe is not uh, the elbow and we get in trouble when the toe tries to be the elbow, uh, which I do sometimes. Um, I'm probably the toe. I don't know. But mm -hmm. anyway, we get in trouble when we try to do too much, but together we are reflecting his glory. And this waiting that we're doing during Advent, but also really throughout the whole year, the church is in this disposition of waiting because we're expecting his second return. Um, this waiting is not this like passive waiting that we do in like a doctor's office or something like that. We're just passing the time waiting for him to return. But as a church and as his people and as his image bearers, we are taking his light, taking this uh, these seeds of this new creation everywhere we go. So whether we're writing songs or writing books or volunteering in our kids' school or volunteering with the refugees down the street, we are ambassadors of Christ and part of this family of God and showing people a different story together. Hmm. You say we're made for an abundant life with God. And as humans, listen to this, friends, we are hardwired to find our home in God and for God to make his home with us. I want to have a, you know two parts to this question. The first part is what are the things that hinder that mindset of us finding our home in God and, and God making his home in us? Because sometimes, a lot of times, I would say, we get in our own way. So what are the bigger, biggest hindrances to this happening? Yeah, I mean, I think right now, I think we're we're living in such a, a digital age where it's very, I don't know about you, but I, I feel mm -hmm. this fragmentation and just mm -hmm. this hurry and a lot of voices speaking in saying, this is the story you live in. No, this is the story you live in. And I think that to put that away and remember, no, I was designed to be at home with God, to meditate on his word, to put my phone away, <laughs> um, to be like Psalm 1 says, like a tree by the river, nourished by his word and by his truth and his story is what helps us remember that our home is not here. Our home is in God. And we're going to have a lot of people, a lot of voices coming at us, telling us how we should be living and what we should be doing. But we have to always go back to his word to remember the story that we're a part of. You know, that makes me circle back to the subtraction idea, because when you think of all the things that distract us, that does, just uh, exhaust us and that make us feel so fragmented, what if, friends, as we go into this uh, season, you said, I'm going to put some boundaries around that. I'm going to fast from my phone. I mean, I'm going to check it when I have to, but even put limits on that four times a day or whatever, where, you know, because our default is to go towards things where we're squandering time and we wonder why we're exhausted. And even the light in your eyes uh, on a phone can affect your sleep at night. So what if you just sought the Lord to say, how can I take some of the things that I'm doing that leave me feeling fractured and fragmented 
and maybe just minimize those in this season to be mindful of being seeing my people looking in their eyes, you know, without scrolling in my phone. I mean, that in and of itself, Caroline, could make this one of the most meaningful seasons ever if we did some proper subtraction, don't you think? Yeah, for sure. And I I mean, I think that sometimes we don't realize that Advent is actually supposed to be a season of repentance in the same way that Lent kind of is, where we need to not numb ourselves to the reality of our need for the Savior. Because if we do, if we get too busy, if we fall into the hustle and bustle, and I, I know it comes for all of us, there's a lot to do during Christmas, but I feel like as Christians, we have to resist and sit in that ache and sit in the reality of our need for Jesus. And then the Christmas, uh, the the beauty of Christmas will shine brighter because we have put our phones away, because we are not numbing out, because we are not over busy, because we've recognized our need. That will make Christmas so much more beautiful. Hmm. This dear listener writes in, love this episode. One year when our kids were very young and life was very full, Christmas snuck up on us and felt like we'd not prepared our hearts at all. That year, I decided to change that going forward and start a family tradition celebrating Advent. Every year at the beginning of Advent, I make a special meal. Oh, I could cry. This is so beautiful. I, could, I make mm-hmm. a special meal, give the kids a wrapped gift. It was always a Christmas book. Sometimes it's a board book with flaps and felt figurines, sometimes a plastic nativity. And when the teen, when let's see here, my little thing jumped. Oh, come back. Um, my text line is jumping. Okay. When they were teenagers, a CD of Christmas music to go along with the reading of the scripture passages uh, was their gift. We also light simple candles on the dining room table at dinner during Advent. Very simple votives, even when we're only eating leftovers. Wow, that's great. It sets Advent season apart from every other time of year. We read the Bible passages as we go and simply talk about waiting and remaining expectant. It helps us to have true joy when we get to Christmas and we have full hearts. I love that so much. Anything you, any comments you have for that? I love that too. I think for every family, it'll be different, but how can we stir up for our kids that anticipation? And then, you know, another thing to add to the conversation is on the church calendar, Christmas is actually 12 days, you know? So uh, the 12 days of Christmas, that famous song is 12 for a reason. So we don't have to just celebrate on that one day and pack it all in. We can actually continue to celebrate the beauty of Christmas for 12 days at least. Um, And really, that is what we celebrate all year long. But I think Mm. that uh, as we anticipate that celebration will be all the more joyous. This dear, before we go to break, this dear listener, he writes that he has no family and he's got a sad face there. Do you have any Mm. words of encouragement for him? As I mean, that truly, I think the one thing about the holidays is why so many feel such a deep grief is because it seems like some are living their best lives while others are grieving losses or feeling like they're without the things they long for. Anything you want to say to him? Yeah, I probably want to say two things. Um, First of all, I know that's so hard. And I think that Advent helps us to recognize what's hard and then not to wallow in it, but to be driven to the gospel. So for him, the promise that we can be part of the family of God, um, hopefully here on earth through our church and through the people we have fellowship with, but even more, um, one day we will sit at a table and feast, as it says in Revelation 21, and we'll have such joy and we will be part of his family forever. And so rather than just uh, acknowledging that hard thing of no family and staying there, let that drive you to the good news of Jesus and give you uh, such a grateful heart for what he's done for us. And then I guess the second thing is I already mentioned, but I do hope and pray that uh, he can find a church where some folks might invite him in and he can feel, even if they're not his uh, biological family, he can feel a part of a family this year. Hmm. So good. Lord, we do pray for this dear friend. We pray that you would show him his people, that you get him in a Christian community surrounded by people who love him, that are appointed to be in his life, and that he would be accessible, that he'd open up his heart and they'd open up their heart, and there would be uh, the start of great friendships and uh, and fellowship. And this year it would be different, that he would not feel alone. As we go to break, I'm going to read this excerpt from Caroline Cobb's Advent book. We are made to live In the all-satisfying presence of God, nothing else will quite do, and we know it deep 
in our bones. Caroline Cobb is my guest today. Her book is Advent for Exiles. It's just beautifully written. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. We'll be back in a minute. Thanks so much for tuning in to Suzy Larson Live, talking to singer, songwriter, and author Caroline Cobb. She's got a brand new book, Advent for Exiles, 25 Devotions to Awaken Gospel Hope in Every Longing Heart. You might be thinking it's not Advent yet. It's too early. It's only a couple weeks away, so we're talking about preparing your heart. I don't like to wing anything. I don't like to show up and go, oh, that was today. (laughs) I want to give thought to things that matter and prepare for them and prepare him room and make space for Jesus. And I think if you decide ahead of time, this could be, whether you're walking through the valley of the shadow, you're on the mountaintop and it's a good season for you, this could be one of your most meaningful holiday seasons ever when you make space for Jesus, when you give thoughtful uh, consideration to the fact that Jesus came and he's coming again. Uh, Judy, one of our wonderful listeners, uh, writes in, I have looked to my phone and computer too much, too often lately. I've gone back to sitting with the Lord and thinking about his love for me, even if it's just a few minutes at a time, instead of defaulting to my phone. It helps me, especially when it's a sunny day. I just plant myself in the sunshine. It helps me to think about his glory. This strengthens my soul so much. Such a good word, Judy. Thank you for that. So, Caroline, at the end of your each chapter in these readings, uh, you offer suggestions. Like one of them, you say, fast for my meal today and use that time to make space for Jesus. Another one you say, find a windowless room, turn off the lights, sit in the darkness until you begin to feel uncomfortable, then sit a little bit longer. Set a timer if you need to. In the darkness, acknowledge your desperate need for the light of the world and pray out loud. God in the darkness, we wait for you. Come with your light. Pray it several times, maybe emphasizing different phrases. Speak about that one, if you would. Yeah, I I love um, that God has made us imaginative creatures. Mm -hmm. We're not computers that just download input, you know, or truth. Um, But I wanted to leave some space in this book for people to not just hear the truth, but also to get it from their head into their gut. And so there's music woven throughout, some song lyrics, but also these responsive practices like this one, Sitting in the Dark. And the hope is that someone could experience this idea that Jesus is the light of the world in a very visceral way. Um, yeah. Perhaps it would come anew to, you know, come alive in a new way to them if they're willing to actually put this practice, uh, to do this practice and to, to turn off the lights and literally long for the light in that dark place. And so yeah. I've tried to wa- uh, weave several of these in so that people can experience the truth of the gospel sort of in a physical way. Um, and there's also responses to pray as well. But that's the hope behind that. It's so beautiful. And you think about these are really simple things. They don't cost you any money. They just take some time and intention. But imagine sitting in that dark and then maybe even lighting a candle carefully so that you don't start the house on fire, (laughs) but you've got a good plan ahead of time, or maybe you've got one that you flip a switch and it turns on. But really you sit in the darkness and ponder, you know, the ache of your lostness and then rejoice when the light shines, you know, in the beginning Mm -hmm was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Caroline writes this, This Advent, would you let the ache of your own exile, the dark shroud of your helplessness and sin, make Jesus' first Advent and his promised final Advent all the more glorious to you? Hold firm to your hope. Lift high the radiant light of the gospel. What in earnest, wait in earnest for the sunrise breaking through and sing for joy at the sight of it. Even when I read that excerpt, I was thinking of the lyric, let heaven and nature sing. I mean, I feel Mm -hmm. like your words are calling us to look at the imagery right in front of us for just signs and reflections of God. You know, sunrises, sunsets, dark rooms, lit candles, all of these things remind us of the bright light that came to us in a dark world. Say more about that. 
Yeah, I, I, uh, so Isaiah, the book, and really a lot of scripture is full of metaphor. I think the Bible is just dripping with metaphor and imagery. And again, I think that's because God designed us in this way to um, receive information, not like a computer, but, you know, as images and in story. And that's on purpose. And so I think even now we see all around us, um, these places where wasteland places are blooming into gardens. That's in Isaiah, where darkness grows into light, where our leaders um, are are weak and we're longing for a shepherd king that is good. And in all of these places, these are really signs of exile that lead us to long for Jesus who comes to make his home with us. He's the king. Mm -hmm. He is the light. You know, he is the seed in the wilderness that is going to grow into a garden. As you studied Isaiah, anything else just kind of resonate and kind of imprint on your heart? Um, One thing that I love is that some people call it the fifth gospel. And Mm -hmm. I think that it's true. It's, It's got everything in there, you know, our... The glory of God, our need for God, um, how bad our sin is. Uh, it's also got, you know, the suffering servant and what Jesus has done for us in Isaiah 53 and really throughout all of Isaiah. And then at the end, it's got the new heavens and the new earth where, you know, he will wipe every tear away from our faces and death will be swallowed up forever. So the whole of the gospel that we believe in, this story that we are living in is right there in Isaiah. And I I think it's such a beautiful book and it's got a lot of hyperlinks to the rest of of scripture and especially revelation as we look to the end of the days. Hmm. Let's talk about one of the days reading that you titled Jesus as Exile in Reverse. Say what you mean there. Yes, I love that. He and mm-hmm. and we mentioned John 1, you know, that the word became flesh and dwelled among us. And that that word dwelled actually means to tabernacle with us. So, when he when they had to be exiled from the promised land where the temple was, symbolically they were exiled from where the presence of God dwelt. And when Adam and Eve had to leave the garden, you know, they were exiled from where the presence of God dwelt. And so when Jesus comes to us in our darkness and shines as the light in our darkness and tabernacles with us, God made flesh. He's literally doing exile in reverse. He is yeah. coming to us. And when he came, he inaugurated this new kingdom that is continuing to uh, bear fruit even now. And the spirit, of course, is another iteration of God dwelling with us through his spirit and through his people. And then one day we're going to see him face to face when he comes back. Um, But I love that idea that everything sad is coming untrue as we talk about in Lord of the Rings. And Mm -hmm. one day, you know, we're going to see him face to face. You know, I think that might be a theme just to ponder. Um, I mean, you could use that one theme and ponder it all Advent season. When you think of Jesus leaving the glories of heaven, the beauty of heaven, and not just coming to earth, but literally crawling into the womb of a teenage virgin girl, born into poverty, in a stable, and entrusting himself to a sinful people, living, you know, walking the dirt roads of this life, facing off with Pharisees who are constantly waiting for him to mess up. I mean, it was an exile that we can't even fathom when you think and you contrast it from what he stepped away from to take on human Mm -hmm. form. I mean, that in and of itself, Caroline, just again, (laughs) leaves me in breathless awe and wonder that, you know, that he was so content to be misunderstood so that he could die our death and pay our price, you know? Right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Philippians 2, there's so many passages that speak of what he's left on our behalf. And we, yeah, it's undeserved grace. Yeah. Well, I got to read this um, from your book. Do you see it? With Jesus, nothing holds you back from leaving your exile behind and entering into the presence of a holy God. No curse, no curtain, no flaming sword or threat of death. If you are in Christ, nothing you have done or do or will do can separate you from God. How have you learned to walk in that identity as you've grown more in Christ? You know, because we know this, the enemy's always going after identity, always, always bringing accusation, Mm. exploiting weaknesses. And we've got to get this into ourselves and into our bones and into our spirit 
that nothing will separate us from his love and that we get to be a work in progress without condemnation. How have you kind of come upon that truth in a way that's changed you? Yeah, I think about, and Paul talks a lot about this in the New Testament, that we have really like put on Christ. And so when we come into God's presence, it's not us coming into God's presence by ourselves on our own merit, but we have been adopted as his children and we are literally in Christ, united with Christ. And so we get this access that is totally undeserved, that is only a gift to be with God. And then we get to live lives of worship and response uh, and obedience in response to his love for us, not to earn it, but in response to the favor that we have in Christ. And again, it was Christ that earned that favor. (laughs) Christ is the one that we are inside of as we come into God's presence. And so why would we ever um, forsake that access? Why do we act like Mm. it's it's not the best thing ever? Um, I think that's important for us. You know, like, why do we tarry? Um, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless Mm -hmm. pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And so I think one encouragement I would say is that if we're in Christ, access the Father, you know, um, go into his presence because that is the invitation through Jesus. Praise God. I really do believe, and this is why I wanted to do, uh, you know, to start early with Advent, that if you could create some space um, to enter his presence in the beauty of the season, being mindful of Jesus, the idea that he came and he's coming, I truly think it will help you wrap up the year with perspective and enter the new year with perspective rather than just overdoing all of it and feeling like, you you know, what I think when people say, I can't wait till Christmas is over so I can finally focus on Jesus, it's because everything else has crowded out. It doesn't have to be that way. And that's why we're talking about it now. So we're going to pause here. When we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about the idea of just setting our hearts on anticipation. And I'm talking to Caroline Cobb today. Her book is Advent for Exiles. Four copies to give away today. Text the word book to 877-933-2484. We'll be back in a minute. You know, this show is all about deeper life in Christ and powerful life on earth. I try to handpick my guests in a way that helps you cultivate an intimate, thriving walk with God that translates in how you show up on the earth. Because I'm passionate about health and the healing process, we bring doctors on the show. I'm passionate about renewing our mind. We bring a neurosurgeon on to talk about a biblical renewing of our mind, but also adding that science and faith perspective. I talk about how to open God's word and find his truth in a fresh and compelling way. Maybe someone shared a show with you, and as you've been listening, you realize you like the topics. You're brand new to this whole faith thing. Maybe you've got some questions about what it means to follow Jesus. Well, we're so honored at Faith Radio to partner with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and we'd love to help get some of your questions answered. If you've got questions about beginning this faith journey, about starting to trust Jesus and follow him with your life, text the word FAITH to 41224. Trusting Jesus for your eternity and following him every day of your life will be the most important decision of your whole life. I pray you're having a fantastic day. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, talking to singer, songwriter, and author Caroline Cobb, who wrote a new book, Advent for Exiles, 25 Devotions to Awaken Gospel Hope in Every Longing Heart. And if you appreciate um, great writing, this is beautifully written Advent book. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. We've been just talking about preparing him room and uh, making space and being intentional. That's what we're talking about it now, heading into the season going, I refuse to let the rat race move me out of the sacred pace. I'm the boss of my body. (laughs) I'm going to draw some boundaries about what I will and will not do so that I can rightly honor God in this season. And Caroline writes, Advent is a season set aside for waiting and watching. Even as we count down the days to Jesus' first arrival at Christmas, we also anticipate his promised second arrival when God will bring his exiles home and the curse of sin and death will be undone 
at last. Like the faithful remnant in exile, we scan the horizon, looking for the sunrise to break brightly into all this darkness. We wait for the seeds sprouting green out of the dirt, making all this barren wilderness into a glorious garden. You know, Advent is meant to be a a season of anticipation, of of new beginnings, of preparing. And uh, I did some reading uh, just on, um, you know, brain science, and our brains actually need anticipation. It's actually like vitamins for our brains. It's super nourishing to be looking forward with hopeful anticipation. And how much more so, Caroline, for the coming of Jesus. And that that day is nearer than it's ever been. Mm-hmm. That's right. Every day. Mm. What does that mean for think, you? As Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> no, you go ahead. I, I, I really love to hear more of your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, we all say that we believe that he is coming back. Um, I say that, but sometimes we don't function as if that's, we really believe that that's true because I think that if we knew that he was coming back and we believe that with all of our hearts, um, we would have a different kind of urgency. Uh, we would prioritize differently. Uh, we would, um, yeah, there would be a different way of living. And I think for me, honestly, too, it would be, I would be sharing the gospel a lot more um, mm. if I believe that deep in my bones. And so I want to be constantly reminding myself that he is returning and that he is the king. And I want to live yeah. right now as a citizen of heaven. And, you know, I'm going to be praising him forever. And so I want to live like that right now and uh, sharing the good news as much as I can. So good. And we're just getting ready to wrap here in a few minutes. But one of your chapters, you ask this question and I'd actually love for you to answer it. You say, God is comforting his people in exile with a promise of undeserved restoration and flourishing. And here's the question, but how? How do we account for this shift from well-earned judgment to unmerited delight? How can God grant a harvest of flourishing and joy when his people have continuously sown into idolatry and sin? Give me your thoughts on that question. Yeah, I think in that passage, I might have been talking about Isaiah 61, where um, Jesus is actually going to read from that in Luke 4 when he announces that he is the Savior. He's the Messiah they're waiting for, and he's going to give beauty for their ashes, which is such a beautiful passage. But again, we ask, how? I mean, what have they done to deserve that? And I think that the answer is right there. It's because of Jesus, because we are Mm -hmm. in Christ and we are invited to be grafted in to this better vine. Um, there's an image in the Old Testament where Israel and or God's people were always imaged as like a vineyard and they were just bearing bad fruit. They weren't being faithful. And then Jesus comes in, as John 15 says, as the true vine and he has grafted us into himself. And so we bear fruit because of him, because of him inside of us. And that is, again, a gift that we get to respond to with lives of worship and obedience. And again, just totally a gift totally good news. Hmm. What do you know about God now that you didn't know as well, maybe five, 10 years ago? You know, one thing that I have thought a lot about is just my identity as God's beloved daughter, as God's child. I think that um, maybe at the beginning, I understood my identity more as like a sinner forgiven, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. seeing my sin and realizing how much he has forgiven me. And that is my identity, but I'm so much more than that. And then sometimes I might default into, I'm a dutiful servant, you know, and we are, we're supposed to be servants of God and faithful in our ministry and everything we're doing, serving him. But we are not just that. We are more than that. He's called us to be beloved children of God. And again, the access we have to the Father because of Jesus um, as his children is incredible. And we don't have to just say that we're sinners forgiven or dutiful servants, even though we are. We are are serving him. We are repenting from our sin because we are his children because we are beloved before we produce or perform or do anything. Mm -hmm. And again, that's, that's what we live our life out of. That's the wellspring that our life gets to be lived out of that. We are his beloved children. 
So good. I was going to ask you to pray, but I have the benefit of watching the clock. And uh, so I think if you don't mind, I want to just pray a blessing on everybody yes. listening and on you as well, Caroline, on all of us. But Father, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, Jesus, for coming to earth, for living a sinless life, for dying our death, paying our price, Lord, and and blowing the doors off of the devil's claim on us, Lord God, for making a way where there is no way so that we can know that we can walk in your presence, not only as we live here on earth, but that one day we will see you face to face. So Father, I pray by the power of your spirit, you'd pour out your spirit in a fresh way on Caroline, on myself, on everybody listening, on our families. Give us a new hunger and thirst for you, for your presence, for your word. And I pray this season would be unlike anything we've ever experienced. We would experience the goodness of God, the reconciliation of God, that the prodigals would come home, that we would see shifts in family members that we've been praying for forever, that we would have by the tree moments where we sit and reflect on your goodness and your grace. God, we trust you. We love you. We want more of you. So pour out your spirit in a way that changes us forever. We thank you. We thank you for the way that you love us. We thank you that you move when we pray. And I thank you that as I pray, I am praying your will. I can know that you're already answering, already moving in the hearts of these, your dear people. We look to you with anticipation and expectancy. In Jesus' name, amen. Caroline, you're beautiful and precious. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me, Susie. I really, really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, such a great time. And check out her book, Advent for Exiles. Thank you for tuning in today. Pray you found some encouragement here. We love and appreciate you. And if you ever need prayer, never hesitate to send it to the text line, 877-933-2484. And we will meet you back here next time. Thank you for listening to this conversation from Susie Larson Live. These conversations are available because of your support. You could become a supporter now at myfaithradio.com. Please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes and then share it with friends so together we can all have a deeper life in Christ.